Hello everybody and welcome to the Redmen TV and your latest edition of the Deep Dive. My name is Dan Club. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by the brilliant Josh Williams alongside me as we take a look at what Andre could potentially bring to Liverpool in the January transfer window if indeed he does sign for the Reds. Josh, how are you mate? You okay? Good mate, yeah. Looking forward to getting into this one. Yeah, well, we both spoke off air very briefly about Andre and how much or how little we've seen of him. We both had an eye on him for quite some time. Now, I imagine since the transfer link started way back in the summer, um, I've managed to watch him a couple of times live, and I think he's I think he's a wonderful footballer, quite frankly, I really do. And I'm sold on him becoming a red, so let's find out as to why we might well be. Those transfer links that I mentioned are continuing all the time, by the way. There's more and more talk. He himself came out the other day and spoke about the links to Liverpool, said it would have been wrong to sort of move in the summer because of the Copa Libertadores final which is coming up on Saturday night they play Boca Juniors at 8 o'clock UK time Saturday so that'd be nice for us all to watch him uh, but you don't need to because we're going to tell you everything you need to know right now so do you want to get into it let's do it yeah yeah I mean this is this is one that's been in the works for a couple of months now but we haven't really got around to it at any point but I'm glad we'll touch on it now because when it comes to the deep dive obviously it's about like kind of critical analysis and stuff like that and sometimes that can be taken as a bit negative yeah um, and the critical word is kind of big. In yeah, there, yeah, it? yeah. <laughs> so if, if we get linked with a player and he's like he's not the right fit, we kind of just say it, and it gets looked as negative sometimes. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Andre, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I'm I'm, I'm pleased to say I'm sold. Yeah, good. <laughs> I'm actually convinced that he's a he's a really good player, and um, I hope Liverpool sign him basically. But we'll get into why uh, during the show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and. You mentioned in the agenda to me, and it caught me off guard, to be honest with you. This could be the, la the first player Liverpool have signed direct from South America since Sebastian Quartes. Is that right? I mean, I yeah. know Lucas from Gremio would be another one, Brazilian from Brazil, of course. But yeah, since Quartes, because this isn't, I suppose that's kind of an, a bigger point, really, in that it's a little bit of a fun fact. But also, Liverpool in recent years don't go direct to source. We wait for Brighton to do it, and then we go get them off Brighton or Portugal to do it, as yeah. it may be. You know what I mean? So this does feel, if it does happen, like a bit of a shift from Liverpool. Is that because on so special. What 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 do you think that is? Yeah, it's a, it, it is an interesting one. It's an interesting little element attached to the link, really. As you say, Coates was the last one who who moved direct from South America to Anfield, and I mean his success at Anfield is maybe a reason why we haven't done it since. To be honest, I think Donny also moved at the time, or or a goalkeeper or something. Could have been there news. Yeah, yeah. There was a goalkeeper at the time who moved in the same summer, um, and Lucas is obviously another example. But generally, we don't do it, and I think. Maybe the reason for that is because there's just more of a risk attached yeah. to it. It's it's harder to do business with those clubs, mm -hmm. um, because maybe because of the language barrier and things like that, um, and the distance and things, and the fact that you know you you can't usually. It's not overly simple to just buy their players in in our summer because it's the middle of the season for them. Yeah. So it's a bit tricky in that sense, and maybe we just want to see those players in Europe to see how they how their ability translates before we then move for them. But on top of all that, I also think that it's it's becoming trickier for Liverpool to to kind of gain an edge in the market because you know the, the data is becoming more and more popular and seems to getting used and things like that. Um, it's harder to unearth these gems. So maybe you kind of go a little bit further afield to do it, like Brighton have done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you've seen the success of Brighton doing it as well. And I suppose you can't ignore that. Like Liverpool, Liverpool prided themselves on being so astute and so clever in the transfer market for so many years, sort of picking up gems from predominantly across Europe, of course. But I suppose that has to evolve, and you have to move on with that. And when you see, as you mentioned, Brighton doing it, and the port, I suppose the point actually is the fact we've been sort of buying from Portugal so much, and we've seen Darwin Nunes, Luis Diaz, both players yeah. who come from South America originally. There is a point whereby you go. You're paying a premium then because you've got to pay the, the, the European fee for them. But if you go direct to source, yeah. I mean, Andre, I think the talk is the release clause is around the 25, 20, 20 million mark. I mean, if he turns out to be what we believe he could be, that's an absolute steal, isn't it? In this day and age, that's crazy money. I mean, before we go on to him, you mentioned here he's 22 years old. It seems to be the age profile of lads we're buying as well. But we did also interestingly put the fact he's five foot nine. So I put it next to it. Is that a concern? Is that why you mentioned it? Or is that just a, a passing comment? Uh, it's a bit of both, I suppose. I think it would be a concern in the sense of if he's playing like that mm -hmm. as a lone uh, six, like Fabinho did. Yeah. I always say on this show, like if you're looking for a proper holding midfielder, a proper DM, if you want, mm -hmm. usually they are kind of 50% centre back, 50% centre mid. Really, if you think about the profile of them, 
Someone who's five foot nine is probably not playing as a centre half ever, unless he's Javier Mascherano. That's I mean, the only one that came to my mind. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Fabio Cannavaro yeah. was quite short as well. He right? was, yeah, he was, yeah, beast though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think it's it's a subtle little. It's something you've got to factor in at yeah. the end of the day. You know, the height of the player, especially if he's playing in centre mid and defensive deeper areas where he's going to be consistent for aerial balls and mm-hmm. that. But in terms of his ability on the ball, it's enough for us to overlook the fact he's five nine. Okay, yeah. well, I was going to ask you then. So, in terms of what he is like, you mentioned Fabinho there. Is he akin to him at all? Because, I mean, Brazilian defensive midfielder from Fluminense, is that where the likenesses stop? Is he anything like him in any way, shape, or form, do you think? He's a bit like him uh, in terms of, I think he would come in and, and occupy that role, the role yeah. McAllister's occupied for the, for the past six months or so. I think Andre would come in as that player who would kind of predominantly remain behind the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, he would. Ha- take part in, in the kind of bank of five safety net behind the ball as opposed to the, mm-hmm. the attacking bank. Um, but in terms of like what he does on the ball and how he behaves as a player, for me, he's more in the mould of a Thiago than a, um, than a Fabinho. And if you look at his numbers as well, he just looks like the absolute signature controller. Like you've got a, there's certain boxes that control the tick on, in terms of the data and he ticks them all like with flying colours basically. Okay, interesting. I want to touch on something. There's a point I've made a couple of weeks ago, I think it was on the podcast, and you just kind of alluded to it there very briefly. Is the McAllister thing? Because obviously we've seen him play in the six. A position, a role. I think we know he's carrying out, and he's carrying out well. I actually thought the game on Sunday was his best performance in that position. But it's not naturally suited to him. His second nature isn't to be a defensive-minded player. He wants to be more advanced. Mm. But I wonder, there's something in the fact that we signed Endo and maybe he's not quite up to speed yet or whatever it may be, so he wants to get McAllister in there. But I have wondered, it has crossed my mind, whether McAllister doing it in the way he does it, in the style that he does it, which is that more controller, he's a passer, he's a technician, is a precursor to getting the one in, which is Andre, mm. in terms of the way he does Because Andre then is like, he's a defensive beast as well as being the controller that you've mentioned because he's got all the technical ability, but also he gets himself about. So in terms of our system, in terms of our style, McAllister doing it now and then Andre coming in there after feels like a very natural sort of switch. Yeah, no, it's a good shout. And I think I have questioned as to whether, like we're all expecting this Fabinho replacement and there was talk of like, uh, of Casado, we even bid for Casado to be fair. There's talk of like Polina and players like that. Mm. The more I've kind of, watch Liverpool this season, the more I've kind of thought like maybe we won't just go for a stereotypical destroyer yeah. and maybe we will go for a player who is a bit more defensive minded than McAllister but is mainly still offering value on the ball mm. where, where everyone's offering value on the ball essentially mm. and Andre's that Andre is a bit more defensive minded than McAllister is mm. as in less inclined to take a massive risk less eager to pick up the ball up around here and shoot mm-hmm. but still offers a lot of value on the ball for you, still offers you a lot of control. And I think that's the big word, that, that's the big word that Linda seems to want, especially mm-hmm. just con- t- control basically on the pitch. Yeah. I think we lost that last season. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, to an extent, the better you are on the ball, the more in control you are on the ball, the less you have to do defensively and the less need you have almost for a destroyer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, looks like, it looks like he offers a whole lot, doesn't he, really? Um, you've got some stats on his passing and stuff, if you want to go through them with us. Yeah, well, first up, I think it's just a passing network just to kind of capture a point that um, I think a lot of people will will know what they know about Andre so far based on compilations on Twitter and that's that's understandable but the thing is with highlight reels it's the highlights so it, it, it's picking up on the time he broke a line mm-hmm. the time he shot from 40 yards the time he switched to play 50 yards you know whatever it is yeah. For me, based on what I've seen, he's not overly that kind of player for me. And this is just a random passing network that I've picked up from him this season. Mm -hmm. This is the last time he posted over 100 passes in a a league match for Fluminense. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can see there, it is predominantly like middle third, sideways lateral passes, Mm -hmm. control, short like maybe five, five, six yards or something like that. There's a few where he's he's finding the final third, mm. but as you can see, it's very few. Yeah, so yeah, sure. that's the kind of player that I wanted to paint, as in that he's more like that than this kind of, you know, a De Bruyne or a Sobosly or, mm. or someone like that. He's more like a Rodri, 
yeah. as in like keeps just over keeps it and, tipping yeah. over. Gives yeah. it to the lads, you suppose, like yeah. and your graphic versions, your Curtis Joneses. You've got that little level up of creativity, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Well, I mean, Lind- Linda said literally today in his pressure that he misses Thiago. Yeah. And it's fi- it's because of El- and when, when he when he signed Thiago as well, he said this team deserves a player like this. He said. And it's it's that kind of midfielder who will dictate tempo for you, speed it up when it's right, slow it down when it's right, mm-hmm. uh, put your foot on the ball, give you control in the middle of the park. Andre's kind of all of that really, and and the the line breaking stuff, mm-hmm. um, through balls and all that. He's got it on his locker, but it's based on his time in Brazil at least lately. It's it's he's not as much of a player in that mould as you would think if you just watch compilations of him. Mm-hmm. But he can do it, you know. Yeah. He's, he's still got that level too. In terms of the Thiago comparison, then we've seen Thiago sort of nominally play as a six during his time at Liverpool. Not loads. He did probably more at Bayern Munich, I would say, than he has done since he's arrived there. Mainly because of Fabinho's dominance for a long time in that role, and injuries, of course, have played a part in Thiago's doing it. But when he has done it, he has felt like that orchestrator type and that controller type. Does he sort of stack up in a similar way to Thiago in terms of that? I suppose you just looked at the pass map there. That's very similar, it would feel like, if you put him and Thiago next to each other. But in terms of the quality, because one of Thiago's great qualities is his use of the ball and his passing yeah. is silky, isn't he? Is Andre anything like that at all in terms of the, his technical ability? No, he is, yeah. He, he never, ever loses the ball. I'll touch on that in a sec. Yeah. His ability to keep possession is unrivaled, basically. Okay. But I think the difference, the, what makes Thiago special is Thiago never loses the ball, but also finds him in the most tightest of spaces. Yes. Finds him, finds him, passes forwards a lot, um, sees things other players don't see. That's what makes Thiago like an outlier. Mm-hmm. Thiago's like a, he's a controller, but he's also like an incredible like creative passer as well, if you, if you need him to be that. Andre is a bit less on the creative side, mm-hmm. but just as controlling as in like, you know, we'll put a real foot hold on the game for you in the middle of the park, and you'll you'll never get the ball off him and things. And um, I suppose that can get up another vista to kind of capture capture that really. Yeah. So this is a um, scatter plot on the bottom axis. You've got progressive passes per ninety, and on the side axis you've got just general pass completion. Um, this is the Brazilian Serie A this season. Midfielders only, and everyone on that list, everyone on that graph has played a minimum of nine hundred minutes. Uh, which is the equivalent, obviously, of 10 full games. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, Andre, nobody keeps the ball as good as he does. I think his his pass completion was about 94%. For perspective on that, last season in the Premier League, Rodri was top mm-hmm. of the Premier League with about 90 or 91% or something like that. Mm-hmm. Andre's up at 94 in Brazil at the minute. Mm-hmm. But in terms of his progressive passes on the bottom axis, he's... Pretty progressive, to be fair to him, mm. but he's not like... I mean, if Thiago was on that, Thiago would... would I'd need to make a bigger graph. Yeah, Thiago's okay. on about 10 pa- progressive passes per yeah. 90, so he's just off the scale, usually, on a normal day, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, th- so th- th- that's where the difference is. They're both just as controlling and both mm-hmm. both just as reliable on the ball and that. Mm-hmm. But in terms of those... I mean, how would you describe it, then, Thiago? That them line breaking, just incisive, cute it's, passes. It's that word. It's the incisiveness of him. Yeah. And it's, he did it when he first came into the side at Chelsea, the second half when he made his debut, and he was just absolutely phenomenal. And it's the yeah. speed in which he plays it, and he almost, you know, when you say like the pass had instructions on it, it's them because he gives it to his <laughs> man, and he's got no choice but to turn and go yeah. because it's it's that good a ball. It's into his feet. It's perfect. The weight on it, absolutely everything, and it gives the defenders around him no chance of cutting it. Out or no chance of dealing with it because it yeah. is it's that that silkiness in which he plays it the pace in which he plays it everything is just perfect and I agree I think again I've seen a little bit of Andre and he does remind me of Thiago that's the one I've had in my head the entire time watching him albeit probably a more sort of robust type player and the type I mean you want that because Thiago's injured a lot but even <laughs> in terms of on the pitch in terms of his defensive duties he's probably more willing to do that even though we've seen Thiago win aerial duels like a freak given his height and stuff like that mm. but Andre just feels more more of, a, more of a defensive monster than Thiago ever did if that makes sense yeah yeah but as I said in terms of like touch, touching on like on the ball stuff and that they're very similar in terms of the control Thiago's probably just a bit more you know he'll, he'll play a pass that bypasses five opponents and takes yeah. them all out the game. I think yeah. Andre's a bit more the killer give it ball. to Salah, mm. give it to 
you know, the man next to him, Soboslai or whatever, and mm-hmm. a bit less elaborate maybe, but yeah. can still do that in his locker. So yeah. when he's playing with better players at Liverpool, maybe we'll see a boost in that sense. And yeah. he'll just become the next, you know, an heir to Thiago's throne almost. Yeah, that's how it definitely feels to me. Um, in terms of, I know another vision one is to touch on, was in terms of how much he gets on the ball and just how much he, he runs the game, really. We've spoken about mm. sort of his ability, but there's clearly a lot of emphasis from his manager. I think it's Fernando Denis down there. And he's also the Brazilian national team manager now and has called him into the side since he got the job. But there feels like a real responsibility on his shoulders to be the one to dictate terms in a football match. Yeah, well, when I was speaking earlier about um, your signature controller, one of the controlling boxes is, is just touches, mm-hmm. just getting on the ball and being a conductor, being an orchestrator of of your team's moves, basically. So this is, again, Brazil this season, uh, midfielders only, minimum 900 minutes played, and this is just touches per 90 and as you can see, Andre at the top, mm-hmm. pretty much in a league of his own, with the exception of Gabriel Neves, who I am unaware of. <laughs> no, 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 no. But aside from him, you know, it's a, it, there's a massive gap there. I think Andre averages, this is on average, by the way, mm. this is averaging over 90 touches per match, per game, per 90 or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so that's, that suggests he's a really dominant player for mm. Fluminense. You know, he... Touches the ball a lot, got real authority in the middle of the park, and it's worth noting as well. They've just um, they've got to the cup, the final of the yeah. the Copa Libertadores, and w- that's with Andre being kind of this central figure. Yeah, right? central yeah. figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the kind of fulcrum of that team. Yeah. Um, and it, it's worth noting as well. Fluminense, I think, in in the Brazilian Serie A, they average the most possession as well. Yeah. So he he's used to playing as part of a dominant side and, and being the main man in the middle for that team and just, you know, spreading the play and, and dictating the tempo and all that. So yeah. he looks like a proper controller, basically. Well, I looked into his stats um, last week, more generally his stats, not sort of the, the, the underlying numbers. But one thing that sort of stood out to me, and I know you wanted to highlight it as well, was his availability, stroke durability, because we all wax Liverpool about Gino Wijnaldum's time mm. at Liverpool and his greatest asset was the fact he was available all the time. And unfortunately, I've already touched upon it, tongue in cheek, albeit that Thiago hasn't been that forward, has he? But Andre, in terms of on the face of it, looks like he will be a lad that can actually play footy forwards on a regular recurrence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not sure he's going to be as unbreakable as Wijnaldum, no, but uh, he's he not is. far off by the looks yeah. of it. Last season, he um, just obviously 38 matches in the Brazilian Serie A. Mm-hmm. He started 30 for them, which is good. Uh, and so far this season, there's been 30 and he started 24 of them. He's obviously still only 22, um, and he doesn't really have any major injuries attached to his profile. He's got a pretty clean bit of health, mm-hmm. and considering his age as well, if you think of the age of McAllister, Soboslai, mm-hmm. Nunes, Canate, all of these players, if, if, if everything goes according to plan, they'll all kind of peak at the same age, at the same time, yeah. and that, that, that's when you start winning club World Cups and Champions Leagues and everything because everyone's at their optimal level at the same point. Mm. Liverpool made a mistake last time in terms of letting everyone fall off a cliff at the same point as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully, oh, hopefully we won't do that again, but in terms of Andre being kind of like a, a potential missing piece of the puzzle, mm. you know, he could really do that for us. Yeah, but just to sort of wrap it up on him then, I mean, we've waxed Liverpool by him for the past 15 minutes essentially, but... In terms of where he fits in the Liverpool system, obviously he will be the sixth, which then allows McAllister, you'd imagine, to sort of add it to the rotation, I guess, of the eighth, because it's not going to be easy for him just to walk in there and say, oh, I'm here now, lads. You've got Gavin Birch, Curtis Jones, Harvey Elliott, Sabozlai, of course. So McAllister's got his own battle on his hands. But just in terms of if Liverpool do indeed get this deal done, it's still a deal that makes a lot of sense for Liverpool, isn't it? We still need that guy. Like McAllister isn't the long-term answer. I think we've seen Endo probably isn't the long-term answer already. So if Andre was to come in, which we here certainly think he may well do, um, yeah, it's a good thing for Liverpool. Isn't I was it? waiting for that to get used. That was coming. I've always been used. I don't. We've gone a bit presumptuous with it to be honest with you. Like we're very much expecting us to sign him. I mean, these cost like nothing, so you know, whatever. But yeah, we think he might. So yeah, anyway. It would be a positive one if Liverpool. And it, coming in mid-season as well is an interesting factor because he's going to have a break. I think their season ends in December. I think I'm right in saying they have the couple of his final and a bit more domestic footy after that. He'll have his break and he could potentially 
coming in January, and we've seen January signings for Liverpool: Diaz, Gakpo. Yeah, I was going to say that. Kickstart Liverpool essentially, albeit not the next end of anything last year, but it can be a real positive, can't it? Yeah, and we're, we're really stockpiling midfielders now. By the looks of it as well, like. I think you're right in terms of McAllister will probably move forward towards becoming an eight. Mm-hmm. I think he'll still play as a six at times. But if you look at the eights then we've got like Jones, McAllister, Sobosly, Gravenberg, Elliot. Mm-hmm. You know, these are all vying for minutes and, and they're all pretty available as well. Yeah. So you could encounter some issues there. But this is this is partially why Liverpool this season seems so intense on staying in all of the competitions, mm-hmm. going far in all the competitions. Because if you can do that, everyone's getting minutes, everyone's satisfied. And you've got real depth as well, but yeah, I can see Anze coming in as I don't think he'll play there immediately. By the way, I think he'll take some time to because there's no rush. You know, I think he'll get better in. Is that because of the massive adaptation and so yeah. it's not maybe transferable? We mentioned earlier on how Liverpool haven't exactly gone straight to Brazil or South America and signed the lad. Is that because the Brazilian Serie A isn't necessarily sort of a an easy fit? From there to the yeah. Premier League, we'd like to see them in Europe a little bit, which might be a little bit simpler. But we mentioned on the show we did earlier on Medman Plus about Sir Bosley and how he's hit the ground running, but that isn't necessarily always the case. So you think he'll have some time to sort of learn what's going on? Yeah, I think it's an absolute world of difference when you think about it. Like mm-hmm. the weather alone, mate. I mean, <laughs> think of the weather from, to change from Brazil to uh, to England, yeah. the state of the pitches, things like that. I think obviously the likes of Alisson will probably put his arm around him and, and turn to you know, kind of bed him in and things like that. I think Linders maybe speaks Portuguese, so mm-hmm. that could benefit him. But in terms of like, even getting to grips with like the calendar, you know, yes. is it, Brazil, it's it's 2023, and that's kind of like, it's it's a year long season like that. Completely different in England. Um, obviously the winter period in England is crazy. Mm-hmm. So I doubt he'll play much of a part in that. Um, so it'll be a really long bed in period for him. And I think we'll probably see him being kind of like a fixed start of the probably next season yeah. moving forward to be honest and the first six months of him arriving if he does come in January will be you know in and out the side I think he'll he think he'll look up when he's playing though yeah. I think he'll he'll give a boost to the players around him because I think very quickly you um you get a gauge as to how good the lad is that you've just signed mm-hmm. and I think people have been impressed by Sobosly and McAllister and that and uh, Anze looks like another one who's just kind of gonna really move us away from the dark days of, of the midfield department that was last season, you know, where we just kind of suffered every week. Yeah, absolutely. Let's hope so. Anyway, we seem to be getting out of it now, but I agree. I think one more sign in um, in January would definitely sort of tick that final box. And I hope and think it might be Andre. Let's hope so, because we've made the circle now. So we're going to have to sign him. We've got no choice. Um, Josh, thank you so much for that. Really enjoyed that. Everybody else, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you want to check out that other show I mentioned on Dominic Sabozlite on MedmenPlus.com, use the code DEEP and you'll get two months of captain subscription for half price. So go over there and get it done. Until next time take it easy hey thank you so much for checking out the content today if you want to get your name in and amongst these wonderful people uh, then head to redmenplus.com join as a legend tier subscriber you're gonna get free merchandise merchandise codes you're gonna get in our discord and you're gonna get your name at the end of youtube videos yes redmenplus.com legend tier status